I'm going to leave you with one thing before Brent and I have a Q&A at the end. Uh, who drinks coffee? Yeah, it's the best stuff. Now, if you were, if you were going to buy one pound of coffee from a growing nation like Colombia, what do you think it costs? Yeah, just one pound. What do you think the grower makes on his pound of coffee? <coughs> Buck 35. It's actually higher than I thought. Yeah. Anyway, now you take your pound of coffee and you package it and you transport it to a grocery store nearby where you can buy it. Now this is the good stuff. What do you think a pound of good coffee costs in a local, a local store? On average in the United States, about 10.99. Now, at a molecular level, has our coffee changed? No, it's just been packaged, right? And it's been transported, so it's convenient to buy. Now, who has one of these? <laughs> yeah, you're not going to like me at all. Any idea what you might pay per pound for that? Now, think about this, right? So the coffee has been ground. It's been delivered to your door. It's available in 30 seconds, and it's your flavor because you're so special. <laughs> yeah. well, 40 bucks a pound. Now, this is one of the few countries where I get to use this picture. They don't have these in Europe. Right? Now you're at a diner. But the coffee is crap. It's been brewing all day long. Right? They don't throw that stuff out. It doesn't have a timer. You don't want to go in at 2 in the morning won't sleep for a week. But you get a nice friendly lady like Mabel. He welcomes you. You'll know why in a minute. Pours your coffee. Hey, would you like a free second cup? Oh, I love this place. What do you think? 125 bucks a pound. Not even good. Nasty stuff. Who had one of these this week? Right? You can't find anything on the planet that's a greater commodity than a coffee bean. I actually have a similar example like this with water. It's worse. <laughs> no, really. What costs more, a liter of gasoline or a liter of water? The water is more expensive. Do you think there's some margin in that? Who owns all the water companies? Uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. Yeah, it's their highest margin product. Right, so. Here's the thing to think about as you go into this sort of, the, we wrap up our day. Um, margins are fundamentally anchored in value. Right? Now, whether we like it or not, a lot of the things that we have sold historically are being commoditized right now. Right? And so what we see out in the marketplace, and the model is very simple. It says, the more I understand the needs of my customers, far right hand side, and the more unique my solution, well, the higher my margins. Right? So if I've got something my competitor doesn't have, and I really deeply understand my, my customers, I'm going to be able to charge a lot. Right? So what we typically see down here in the hardware software realm is what we call market pricing. Right? So hey, I sell Office 365. So does everybody else. Apparently, so does Microsoft, and lots of it. I can't believe that slide. That one thing was amazing. Huge opportunity, just get them back. Right? But, that, but you just sell everything, and this managed, don't think about this as hardware and software, this is also services. If you have a commodity offering that's identical to everybody else in the world, lowest price is the law. Right? So, so the margin structure around this is, is low because it's not unique in it, what I bring to market, and it doesn't address any real meaningful challenges at the customer site. Right? But if you take a bunch of these components, hardware, software, services, wrap it up into a solution, well, now it's going to be a little bit different from my competitors. You can differentiate a little bit more. But for me to do that, I need to understand my, 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 my customers reasonably well. I've got, got to tailor it in some way right, to make it unique. And as a result, the margin structure is higher. Go back one. The next step up in this food chain is not all services. It's outsourced services. Right? You know so much about this customer's business or some aspect of it that they pay you to do something they should hire an FTE for. Right? So again, this does not include all, all managed services. 
right? This is outsourcing, right? You know more about how to do this function than they do. Outsourcing is not about saving money. It never saves money, ever. I sold it for years. It's always more expensive, right? So, so you know, so you, to be able to create that offering, you need to deeply understand that customer and you need to have something that's somewhat unique from your competitors. And of course, at the top of this food chain is IP. Now, IP is not limited to writing code. It can be advisory services as well. But to have that intellectual property or intellectual capital, I got to know a lot about my customer and it's probably going to be quite unique from my competitors. Does that all kind of hang together? All right. So here's where it shows up in, in economics. So this is typically what we see when we look at P&Ls from organizations like yours, right, globally. Uh, we typically see gross margins of about 15% in the resale of hardware and software and dropping. Uh, we typically see project services about 35%. Now there's obviously exceptions to this where you've got some unique services that, that other competitors don't have, but as a general rule, when we see the gross margin in the P&Ls, it's about 35% and dropping as a rule. Now again, we've got the top 150 partners in the US in the room here, right? So you're probably experiencing numbers that may be better than these, but these are the averages. Managed services drive obviously a much higher gross margin, but it's fundamentally predicated on underconsumption. I'm going to sell you a, a managed service. I hope you never call me. Right? The smart ones automate the crap out of the manual work so that they don't have to apply in the resources that service those. Those customers are typically lower cost. The resources that deliver project services are typically more expensive. Right? So you've got a higher margin structure. But what we generally see, of course, in, in terms of IP is, is you, know, you build it once, you sell it many times. Right? There's not labor cost tied to the, to the sale of it, and so you get higher margin structure. Right? So, um, what we've done is created a tool. The link to it is on uh, the URL. Uh, it's a, it's a P&L tool. Um, colleague of mine, uh, Dana Wilmer with CloudSpeed developed this thing. Probably knows more about partner profitability than anybody on the planet, maybe outside Brent. Uh, and so what we've done is created this thing that says, you know, and this is a tool that we provided to the PDMs. The brave PDMs, the ones that understand economics, will come to you with it. Right? That's my guidance to them. Don't go to a senior person and have a P&L conversation you don't understand. They end well. Not. Right? So if you have a, an organ, so that Microsoft is training its people to understand how to have the P&L conversation. So the reason that we developed this is because on the left-hand side of this spreadsheet, we want you to just at a high level kind of list out what are my revenue streams? What are my gross margins? And is this business growing or contracting? On the right-hand side, what does my business look like three years from now? And on the bottom, it really captures, um, we've broken out the sales and the marketing and the R&D from the SG&A. So how much do I spend on sales to drive that revenue? How much do I spend on marketing? And then what's my G&A associated with that revenue? So we've really tried to create a very simple tool for some modeling. And of course, at the bottom, it'll drive out your EBITDA, uh, and both in real dollar terms and a percentage. But the important part is the estimated business valuation. Right? So the, the numbers that calculate that business valuation are based on real transactions in your ecosystem. Right? So uh, the IP that has a higher margin and a lower cost is worth more, valued more, obviously, than project services that get need to resold every year. So there's a bunch of math behind this thing. Right? And, and the reason that we put the valuation in there is so that you can do some interesting what-if scenarios in the future. So the right-hand side of the P&L tool is just going to take the stuff on the left here. And these are all drop-downs, right? There's no magic. Anything that's red, you control. And, and it just extrapolates it three years out. And then there's a new revenue stream component in there where you can say, hey, if I launched a new product or a new service or a new this, Right? And it had this much revenue three years from now, and it was at this gross margin level. Well, what would that do to my profitability, and what would that do to my valuation? But it also kind of forces you to think through, if I launch that new product or service, do I need to spend more on sales? Do I spend more on marketing? Do I have to make some investments in R&D? Right? And what kind of impact would that have? Right? So we all know P&Ls are complicated. We also know P&Ls are manipulated in a certain way based on what you're trying to drive. 
right? Wanted to create a tool at the end of the day that could say, here's a snapshot of my current state, right? And here's what my business is worth if I were to sell it today. Varies in markets, but roughly it'll be quite accurate. And then here's a tool that you can use to start to think about, you know, how much of this new stuff do I have to sell for it to make a meaningful impact on my profitability? How much do I have to sell of this new stuff so to have a meaningful impact on my valuation, right? Now, we all know that there's a cash flow impact to making investments to build that stuff out. We're not oblivious to that, right? But the purpose of this slide is to really, in a real dollar terms, start to think about if I do make investments in IP and that IP does drive a higher margin structure, right? And if my, some of my existing revenue lines are declining over time, what am I going to replace it with? And three years from now, is my margin structure going to be the same on some of those commodity items as they are today? Right? So there's not an end goal of driving some magical number. It's just a tool to start to consider some different configurations of your business. So there's a link to that. I'd highly encourage you, if you feel comfortable, to have that conversation with your PDM. All right. Next steps. Who's got a headache? <laughs> Uh, who's overwhelmed? All right, yeah, I've done my job. So, a um, couple of things. Uh, a link to a digital version of this is obviously on that URL, uh, but I've been doing this for ugh, nine years, working only within the Microsoft ecosystem, helping uh, many, many partners uh, drive this journey. Some we inherit at the beginning, some we inherit at the end. But what we tried to do with the 30, 60, 90 day plan is to put the most critical elements that you could consider committing to, um, to to drive closer to the vision of what we're talking about today. Right? So there's a section in there for leadership, there's a section in there for marketing, section for sales, section for services. Right? So you can kind of what I would encourage you is kind of look at those things and 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 you know have an internal discussion within your organization in terms of what are the right next steps for us at any. And I would highly encourage you to include the PDM in that conversation as well. Right? So I have distilled, as best I can, the single most important elements. And I've tried not to make it an overwhelming journey. Right? Here's the simple steps to go for. So the 30, 60, 90 day plan, that may be the, the 60, 90, 120 day plan for you. Right? But kind of carefully consider those things. You'll find it maps extremely well to the content that we covered off today. In it, Microsoft has put links to all of the supporting assets to help you drive that journey. Now, how many people are a little bit freaked out about developing a net new practice? If you've never done it before, yeah, I certainly would be. So I will tell you that I think one of the best assets that Microsoft has come out with in years, if not ever, are these playbooks. Right, so they're developing how to build a practice uh, for an, eventually all 20 of the solution areas. And it's a step-by-step -step guide based on the best practices of partners that have already done this on how to build out that practice so that it actually takes the risk out of a lot of it. They're fantastic tools. Right? So these are the four that are out there now. Many others are coming. We're writing one of them. So that's the next logical place to go. Right? If, you, if you need some guidance around how to build this practice in a risk-free way, uh, learn from those that have gone before. Right? And there's some, there's some background content around that, blah, blah, blah. I was so jealous this morning when I saw Brent's slide. He'd taken this thing, which is a bit cryptic because I'm visually impaired, and he turned it into something beautiful. But I just wanted to share, here's the steps that I teach the PDMs to go through with you. Step number one, sit down with your partner and together complete the assessment as a learning exercise to define current state. Don't do it in, 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 in isolation. Don't ask them to do it for you. Sit down and ask the questions and go through it and learn about their business. The next step, hey, determine where are you going to make some investments in terms of developing a solution offering or a service offering. Right? Where in the IP staircase do you want to go? Third step, does it make economic sense? <laughs> if no, go back to one. <laughs> right? The next one is a whiteboarding process that I developed uh, around um, business planning. And then the fifth step, of course, is the business plan itself. Right? So just in the, in the spirit of true transparency, uh, this is what we teach them how to do. 
a lot of them are learning how to do this for the first time and they're learning really quickly, right? So the, the more compassion you can show and the more you can teach them about how to think like a CEO, the more value they will bring to you over time. 